if you would now, please welcome to the stage Wade Henderson, Dean Michael Foyer, and the Deputy Managing Editor of Education Week, Mark Bumster. Okay. Excuse me. Thank you. Yes. I thank you, and I would like to um, once again with, to welcome uh, Wade Henderson, who is the past president and, and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, and a former Washington Bureau Director of the NAACP. Um, he'll be joining me and Dean Foyer for a discussion of, of uh, this panel's topic, which is educational equity, equality, and opportunity going forward. Uh, so welcome, Wade and thank Michael. You. Um, I'd like to start out this conversation by asking each of you really to kind of set the context for us in which we as a society should be talking about these issues of educational equity and inequality in our public schools. There's a lot of different lenses that we can put on this. Uh, what's the starting point of the discussion? Do we want to talk about economics? Do we want to talk about mm. segregation and resegregation? Um, talk about political polarization? some combination of all of these things. <laughs> uh, and I'll start with you, Wade. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Honored to be here. Great question. Um, I think, truthfully, you start talking about all of those issues simultaneously. Uh, you know, I begin an analysis like this with that great quote from William Faulkner, that the uh, past is never dead. It's not even past. <laughs> and the truth is, um, you can see that in everyday circumstances. So let me give you three quick ones. The 14th Amendment is celebrating its 150th anniversary this year. Birthright citizenship, which was the foundation predicate for the discussion of the 14th Amendment, is the issue of the day with regard to immigrants and whether there needs to be a change in that policy. Secondly, we just had the election of a senator from Mississippi last night state with the highest concentration of African-American voters in the country. This is a woman who proudly proclaims her affiliation with a racially segregated academy from which she is a high school graduate. But more importantly, her daughter graduated from a racially segregated academy. The third example I would cite is the Pittsburgh shooting at the Tree of Life Temple. It was the most prominent anti-Semitic act in the history of this country and reflects an increase in 17% in hate crime activity over the last year. Was the crime committed by <clears throat> Islamic terrorists, quote unquote? <laughs> Absolutely not. It was a reflection of homegrown terrorism, conditions of which are being exacerbated by the political debate of today. So that's the context in which I think we have to have a discussion about equal educational opportunity. I think there's some slides that you yes, have, are we posting. Have, yes, we have, uh, we have some slide here that, that really shows us uh, yeah. in a very big picture way some of the demographic context for, uh, for the makeup of the, of the nation's school system, uh, the 50 million, 51 million school uh, students and the racial breakdown and also some information about the, the percentage of students who are are in poverty uh, as measured by eligibility for a free reduced price lunch. Well, you've done a great job with that, and I want to acknowledge also a young woman by the name of Francesca Simon at the Leadership Conference who helped research some of this for me as well. She's terrific on this. Uh, and these statistics are useful. But let me say, guys, those are generalized statistics that belie what's happening at the local level. And if you really want to get a sense of what's going on, I encourage you to read some of the complaints that have been filed in the cases that are mentioned on one of the slides, which talk specifically about the equity suits uh, around the country. I'm going to cite one in particular, and that's a case that was filed earlier this year in New Jersey, in Mercer County, which is the home county of Trenton, New Jersey, the capital of the state by a group of civil rights advocates, it's the Latino Action Network, the NAACP of New Jersey, and others, uh, versus the state of New Jersey. And they are challenging an equity or an inequitable educational situation. But here's the deal that's so fascinating. When you focus on what's going on, uh, you have three cities, just as an example, 
Camden, Newark, and Patterson. They have 68 public schools. Collectively, they educate about 30,000 students or over. The majority of those schools have a zero to 1%, zero to 1% white population. Now, why is that significant? Because concentrated race, concentrated poverty, and segregated schools, segregated schools, continue to be a proxy for the kind of investment our communities are prepared to make. And there is structural inequality that, unless we begin to address it, will never respond to the problem that these schools represent. In Trenton, which is the capital of the state of New Jersey, which you see, by the way, mentioned in Hamilton, it's a wonderful production, and they talk about Washington's first conquest in Trenton. Trenton has an 89.1% poverty rate in its over 11,000 public school students. And yet we send teachers there who are barely experienced, who are very enthusiastic, obviously. They want to do good work. But the truth is they're ill-prepared to deal with the problems that a city like Trenton or Camden or Patterson or Newark show for their students. So if you're looking for the first responders to poverty in our country, they're teachers. They're teachers. And when we don't prepare adequately to address the problems of concentrated poverty and racial segregation, then you have a problem. So last point, Mark, and I'm done. This is the, I'm, I'm, I'm into these anniversaries, guys. This is the 62nd anniversary of something called the Southern Manifesto. It was the Constitutional Statement of Principles issued by 101 members of Congress, 19 senators, 82 members of the House, the entire delegations of Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, in response to the Brown versus the Board of Education, pledging, pledging to use all, quote, lawful means to block the integration of public schools. And whether the Southern Manifesto is, is still you know, operative today, which is not, it nonetheless casts a shadow on what's going on vis-a-vis -vis states' rights in schools. So in the absence of some sort of sweeping federal constitutional right to education, which the court considered once in San Antonio versus Rodriguez, a five to four decision, which ruled that education is not a constitutional right, until we tackle that issue or deal with the <laughs> circumstances that reinforce the poverty that we've talked about here, then we're not being serious, guys, about public education. You know, you have residential segregation, and New Jersey is a good example, residential segregation established by law, school districts that are built contiguous to racially segregated communities, and state legislation which requires that students be assigned based on their geographic location. Charter schools in New Jersey draw from the school systems in which they were created. So they are highly concentrated, segregated schools in New Jersey. And the states that are now most segregated are no longer states in the South, those delegations that signed the Manifesto. They are states in the North, New York, New Jersey, and others. So, you know, if I seem a bit pissed, it's because I am. <laughs> the truth is, the truth is, the truth is, guys, this is, this is not rocket science. But we continue to deny the reality of structural inequality coupled with racism, coupled with an unwillingness to fund education in the way in which it needs to be done. And that will change but it will change only when external pressures force it to change, which means the litigation that's been filed in states across the country, we need to lift up those litigators. They are doing a terrific job in reminding us of our obligation to the students under our charge. And then lastly, we're gonna have to figure out as a nation, given the demographic change which is likely to occur, which is occurring, guys, whether the projections of uh, our country no longer having majority population uh, in 2040 or 2050, whether that comes true or not. The expansion of populations in the African-American Latino community and the need for an educated workforce 
will, will require employers and others to invest more aggressively in funding and trying to equalize educational opportunity. So there. Thank well, you. Thank you, Wade. And, and you, you know, you, you've raised, you, you drilled down very deeply into many of the sort of the, the racial segregation components yeah. of what we're looking at and showed the convergence with economic factors. And I wanted to turn it to Michael a little bit because to ask you to unpack a little bit more for us, really kind of the, uh, as you mentioned, Wade, sort of the structural nature of, of this inequality and uh, what is the, what's the economic piece of that? And you've got a couple so of- So be before, you, before you put the slides up, let me, let me uh, uh, just preface this, first of all, by saying thank you to Wade for being part of this with oh, us. Thank you, Mike. I've been stalking this man for decades. And, uh, <laughs> you should all know that he's one of the great heroes of the civil rights movement Please. in our community and in our country. So thank you for being thank here, you. Wade. It's a real honor for all of us. Thanks. Please. Thank you. Um, in my spare time, I'm occasionally a very amateur baker. And I have gotten even more sensitive to the power of recipes. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about the uh, combination of the way our system was designed with two fundamental ingredients. Political fragmentation, 50 states, independent 15,000 school districts, et cetera, and the economic ingredient, which is uh, funding of public education through property taxes. And I put those two together. Um, fragmentation and financing, and that for me is a recipe for disparity. So we shouldn't be actually quite so surprised <laughs> when we then confront the data about the extent, the depth, and the persistence of some of these disparities. On the other hand, and I am as a recovering economist, I'm always on <laughs> one hand and the other hand, on the other hand, there is stunning evidence of the commitment of this same new republic that established this system of fragmentation and financing to the concept of public education. Compulsory schooling was essentially invented in the United States. If you look at the data on where we were compared to many other countries in terms of participation in schooling, and even with respect to the inclusion and the invitation to participate in this system to so many people and such a diverse population with one, of course, glaring, horrible, tragic exception, which was the African-American community that wasn't invited to the party until way too late, until the 1950s, and we're still catching up with that, as we all know. But when you think about all of those trends, the amazing thing is that uh, we have come as far as we have in the embrace of the ideal of public education and the expansion of the franchise. And when you listen to those teachers and educators and the principal here, and she said something about whether she was going to run for president. I didn't catch that exactly. <laughs> but if she decides to run for president, I'm going to sign up and be her campaign manager. Anyway, when you think about the inspiring voices of the people who go into the schools every day and are trying to continue to fill and fulfill that dream of what public education was supposed to be about here, uh, that gives me a little bit grounds for optimism. On the other hand, we know, and now you can look at this data, um, if you think about something like the explosion in income inequality that we have allowed to take place in this country mm -hmm. essentially over the last 30, 40 years. Look, we always tolerated some inequality. That goes with the fragmentation and all the rest. But the explosion in inequality that we have allowed to take place in this country since approximately the mid-1970s is absolutely um, stunning to anyone who is paying attention to the history and to the future of what this country is supposed to be all about. So this is, you know, I'm sort of basically uh, at times a data guy. And here you have, just to put this into context, uh, where we are in terms of inequality uh, with respect to other countries and where we are in terms of poverty with respect to mm. other countries. This thing called Gini is, a, is an economist's uh, tool that we use to measure uh, income inequality, wealth inequality primarily. 
And the US is um, maybe not number one in the world in math and science, but we are getting close to being number one in the world in inequality, yeah. uh, which is really quite a disaster. Uh, with respect to poverty, uh, the fact that we now have somewhere in the zone of 22 to 24 percent of our children living and surviving below the poverty line, this is what the American dream is supposed to be about? Mm -hmm. No. Next slide. Um, this is, again, a kind of good news, bad news story with respect to data. In spite of everything that I just said, we have made significant progress in the reduction of the achievement gap between black and white Americans. Now, that's good news. Two pieces of bad news. First, in spite of that progress, we have also allowed the gap to explode with respect to the affluent versus the less affluent. That's what that picture is about. The other bit of bad news is that people are interpreting this modest reduction in the black-white achievement gap as a, as, a, as a case for saying, oh, good, the race problem is solved. <laughs> well, good morning. It is way not solved. And one should not overinterpret from the evidence of some progress that we can now become complacent and drop all of the attention that we need to be focusing on exactly that problem of race in America. Last slide is, again, evidence of the effects of this income inequality. Yeah. This is a picture of resources that families have available to invest in supplementary activities for their children. Always a gap. Again, this is part of the American scene. But the way the gap has exploded so that today you have this enormous difference in the capacity of parents who have limited income with respect to what they can invest in their children's supplementary activities, including little things, by the way, like test preparation. So if you're wondering why <laughs> college admissions is as complicated as it is, it is in part because we have enabled the more affluent to have access to the resources to give their kids yet another advantage in getting into the most elite and selective schools. I put all that together, and you want an, you want an answer to the context question? I'm reminded of what Oliver Hardy once said to Stan Laurel. He looked around and said, well, we've made a fine mess of things, haven't we? <laughs> so, oh my. Let me, <laughs> wow, so you framed, you framed the issues pretty starkly for us here. Um, and I guess what I would want to ask is, um, you know, what's to be done essentially to raise, raise all of this to the level of public consciousness sure. where effective action gets taken to remedy some of these? No, I, I, think that is the, I think that is one of the central issues. Let, let me also make a quick observation with, and I agree, Michael, with the wonderful slides in your presentation. Guys, I think to look at public education as a, quote, public education issue mm -hmm. uh, misstates uh, the, the true nature of the problem. Uh, public education and the questions of public education are also a question about fair housing. Mm -hmm. So when you look at um, the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court, and, and one of the problems that we're seeing now are the end of court-supervised integration efforts at the state level. You know, they've been supervising these cases for years, and they're backing away from that. And they have said to us that school segregation is, in large measure, a fair housing problem. Hmm. The fact that you have concentrated poverty in communities that were set up by state action to restrict on the basis of race and then build school systems around those very communities guarantees that you're going to have the kind of inequality that exists in very dramatic ways. Right now, there is a, uh, a regulation that the Department of Housing and Urban Development is required to implement. It's referred to as affirmatively furthering fair housing. It's an effort to promote fair housing in communities and in community development. It's being resisted by HUD. It's being resisted. Now, that resistance means that the effort of local activists to try to address the quality of public education available to students is simply not going to be as successful as it might. 
So I think that that's one of the challenges. Now, answering your question, Mark, mm -hmm. what, what do you do? How do you bring these issues to the attention of the public? Uh, I think the business community, I think the business community is actually in a position to drive a lot of change here, guys. There are a set of skills that are needed for the new economy, which we are not producing a sufficient number of students that are really trained in those skills to address the problem. And you hear it constantly from the business community around the country. We're going to have to find ways to dig deeply. You know, you talked about STEM programs. That's obvious. But trying to provide students, for example, with preschool activity, pre-K activity that strengthens their capacity to learn, to help socialize students to the uh, uh, rights and mores of public education is really important. Recognizing that in the absence of truly equitable public education, the challenge of affirmative action is going to be on the table. Now, if you assume that there is genetic you know, distribution, equality, that you know, the, the so-called bell curve analysis is not accurate, and I don't think it is, then I think that the kind of imbalance that you see in the performance of students, which seems to be correlated around race, is really correlated around opportunity. And that, in truth, if you offered the kind of rich environment that students who do well and succeed in higher education also have in the K through 12 space, then the chances of getting a broader distribution of high level performance is increased. I think businesses are driving that. And I think, look, I, I don't assume malice in the population as a whole. I mean, personally, guys, I'm very optimistic. I mean, I grew up in DC, right? <laughs> I grew up in DC. I grew up in a segregated world. I grew up in a segregated world. I was fortunate to be a part of the change that I hope to see come. Mm -hmm. I succeeded beyond my own expectations. And the truth is, the truth is, that exposure tells me that the people I've encountered hold no inherent malice, per se. I think this country affords opportunity in a meaningful way. But you've got to structure how you deliver those opportunities, et cetera. So for yeah. a question for the both of you. So where do you see the rumbles of, of change? I mean, you've diagnosed the issues here. Yeah. Where, what do you see bubbling under the surface that's, that's going to take action? What's happening? You know, rather than just to say that it's, this is what it is yep. and it's going to remain the same, do you see glimpses of, of areas where the, the, uh, the issues are being addressed in a fundamental way? Well, I, I want to pick up on uh, Wade's um, uh, reaffirmation of his optimism. And um, I'm, I also have sort of, uh, I like to think of myself as a somewhat congenital optimist. I must say that it's getting harder these days. Um, Anybody who doubts the effects of environment on genes, I can tell you that my so-called congenital optimism is, is, is <laughs> suffering from the environment these days. Leaving that aside, I think there is a basis for optimism if one is willing to accept one of the, one of the great sort of uh, pe the peculiarities of the American system, which is a reliance on local, innovative, and grassroots engagement and involvement. Now, I don't want to push this too far because, you know, for me, states' rights has as much to do with states' wrongs. So I don't want to, I don't want to get too far into the business of the fragmentation. On the other hand, evidence that we have from communities that are working hard to overcome some of these huge challenges and obstacles that are the result of big macro level economic shifts, all kinds of other trends in our economy and demography, at the local level, there is evidence of progress. And I will mention some examples later. So my, you know, I use the idea of a recipe. So I'm thinking of a new recipe here, which has to do with a combination of uh, smart thinking about the ways in which in localities, citizens can get together and actually rework what's happening and make progress because I think A, that will help them, and B, the news will spread and others will pick up on ideas that are being developed 
by, by those in, in their places. And you think about those teachers and principals who were running for office that we heard before, this is partly the message, at least for me. The second part of the recipe is that we as sort of policy wonks, educators, scholars, researchers, and the like, need to be thinking about the standards of evidence that we apply before we accept uh, the possibility of making some changes. And whenever you come up with someone who says, well, no, we can't do that because we don't have conclusive evidence that it will work yeah. always for everyone and, and, and forever, that's a recipe for stagnation and, and nothingness. And therefore, this combination of allowing some innovative spirit at the local level and recognizing that at times one has to act even based on somewhat limited evidence, as long as there's enough to give you a sense that it's worth trying, that for me is a possibility yeah. that we can really uh, make some positive Wait, change. Where do, where do you see change knocking on the door? Yeah, I, I, see, I, have, I share Mike's optimism, but I will say, guys, look, I, I'm a lawyer, I'm an activist. I'm putting a lot of my money on the lawyers. And, and, and what I mean by that is that when they litigate cases, they bring issues to the surface and force policymakers to deal with them. I look at the Kansas litigation, which has been incredibly successful. I want to give them credit. I look at uh, the, the suit that was filed in, I think, 96 in Connecticut, Sheff versus O'Neill. One, one of the lawyers is now the acting dean up at, at UDC Law School, mm. uh, John Britton. Uh, you know, one of the solutions that came out of that case was magnet schools. You know, I look at the the lawsuit in New Jersey, as I mentioned earlier, and one of the solutions they're pushing is to build for the state to invest in the creation of magnet schools. It's not a panacea, but it affords opportunities to bring students together, irrespective of their race, because there are incentives that the state builds into the school that makes them attractive. And that kind of, that kind of diversity is absolutely essential for the America of the 21st century. And I, am, I, I believe that those lawsuits are a part of a solution. Now, I also have a lot of respect uh, for legislators, both at the state and federal level, that see their responsibility as uh, more engaged uh, to, to really uh, work with public education. I look at the incoming uh, chair of the House Education and Labor Committee, Bobby Scott from Virginia, as uh, offering uh, the kind of legislative promise that's encouraging. I look at Patty Murray and Lamar Alexander, you know, um, uh, at the Every Student Succeeds Act. Look, it's not a perfect bill. I got that. <laughs> but they afforded a level of bipartisanship that is critical if we're going to move forward. You know, Patty Murray obviously brings a lot of experience to the table. She's a teacher. She knows and, and knows the policy issues up and down. Lamar Alexander, people don't know Lamar Alexander very well. He's from Tennessee. And by the way, when I mentioned the Southern Manifesto, there were three senators who refused to sign. Oh, God. Al Gore Sr., Estes Kefauver, both Republicans from Tennessee, and Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson refused to sign and became the president who advanced civil and human rights in a significant way. So I, I, I look at you know, the reality of what's happening, and I, I see uh, these legislators as being important. Lamar Alexander clerked uh, for John Minor Wisdom, who was one of the great Fifth Circuit judges who helped change the landscape of civil rights in this country. The fact that he chose Lamar Alexander as one of his student clerks says something about his character. And that has been the experience that I've had in dealing with him. So I, I'm saying to you, look, I think from an institutional standpoint, the system of state and locally controlled public education has not proven to be equitable because there is not an equitable level of political power among those communities that are most directly affected. And until you can change that, you can't change the political landscape that controls these decisions. Litigation is one tool, and people of decency is another, and the business community collaborating to press for change. I see all of those as factors in pushing for change at the local level. And in Washington, there are NGOs 
that are really very actively involved. I mentioned the one I was affiliated with, the Leadership Conference. It's a coalition of national organizations. Great respect for them. And, and I think that um, you have to look to the NGO community as part of the solution. And then lastly, I, I would just say you have a slide that you may show about uh, student loan debt. Yeah, and I wanted to ask, I wanted to pivot just a little bit yeah. and, talk and, and to ask very specifically about the higher education component to this. Yeah. This, is, uh, this is something that you've been working on. Recently. Something I've been, I've been working on because the truth is K through 12 and, and PK through 12 doesn't really answer the question, guys. I mean, graduating students with a high school diploma and nothing else does not promise the level of engagement in the economic life of the country that it used to. Just doesn't guarantee it. So unless you have some post-graduate uh, high school graduation analysis, it's very hard. And I'm not suggesting that every student needs to go to college. But I do think that community colleges are important elements, and I think four-year colleges are important elements. And I think schools that offer legitimate trade uh, practices are uh, important elements. I have a real uh, uh, concern about for-profit schools and the way in which uh, they are being implemented. I have a concern about four-year schools that generate a level of student debt that is something that becomes a crisis hidden in plain sight. I mean, I know too many young people who are carrying house note size student loan debt that you know, really prevents them from pursuing a, the kind of life that we defined during my generation. They don't buy houses when they're young because they can't afford to. They can't afford to have a family carrying that kind of loan debt. And unless we begin looking at that crisis in a direct and earnest way, it won't happen. I'm working now with an organization called the Center for Responsible Lending, and that's where these stats came mm -hmm. from. And they are really <laughs> concentrating on, among other things, student loan debt. Uh, because they were m very much involved in the payday lending fight and the mortgage scams of you know, the last decade. They see, payday, uh, they see uh, student loan debt as the next big thing facing the country. And I think they're right about that. So I, I see higher education as being a very critically important issue that should be the subject of conversation. But until we get K through 12 correct in terms of how we fund it, the quality of education available to all students, the level of equity that is built inherent in the system. You know, I think that uh, the discussion about higher education will continue to be on the margins. Now, Michael, I wanted to ask you a little bit, just uh, right. specifically as a teacher educator, what is the responsibility of the, of the teaching community to address these issues, and what's the responsibility of the universities that train teachers to, to step in and, and to uh, to take a to move in this direction, right? Well, no, we do we do spend a lot of our time worrying about those questions here at uh, GW and in other universities. I would just add one footnote to Wade's uh, comment about student debt, and that is, um, it is unquestionably a problem and an issue that we all need to be paying attention to. But I would caution us not to allow the student debt issue to become a an excuse for people who rhetorically and otherwise are trying to dismantle our whole system of higher education mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, there are a lot of things about American higher education which are magnificent, um, and this problem of debt is one that we've got to deal with because it has been growing, but on the list of, of things to really focus on, uh, I wouldn't want the debt problem to become one that is for more fuel to the flames of people saying higher education is too expensive, doesn't pay off, and ought to be completely dismantled. Um, way, way too, too fast moving on that. So uh, a lot of the problem of higher education has less to do uh, with debt, I think, than it has to do with the abdication of the states in their responsibility to continue treating higher education as a public good. And to the extent that we've really had one of the most remarkable systems of public higher education, and by that I would even include the private institutions that benefit, had benefited from the various kinds of federal and other state uh, financial aid systems and all the rest, that has been a, a remarkable achievement 
Um, and now the fact that uh, so many of our uh, large public institutions are themselves competing for resources in the ways that uh, require them to be focused much more on tuition, which leads to a de in any way, you see where I'm going on yeah, this. So as far as teacher, <laughs> teacher educators, yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, there is a, there is a, bit, of a, a bit of a tendency whenever there's a huge social problem that is identified to say, aha, it must be the fault of the schools. And in fact, the teachers that we know and work with are the real heroes in this whole system because they go mm -hmm. to work every day and the vast majority of them are doing exquisite mm -hmm. work in circumstances that the rest of us sitting in a very beautiful auditorium here don't usually have to, have to grapple with. So point number one is just to keep in perspective that one of the other problems with the way the whole system is, is structured or under understructured is that these heroes of the system are actually not being either compensated or appreciated and respected to the degree that they should be, number one. So very quickly, if yeah. you can give us a couple of, because I want to be able to, to squeeze in some Q&A here. Sure. Um, give us a couple of examples of what you think is working that actually is working in this arena. Okay, so that's great because the, the, you know when it comes to looking for a basis for some optimism and some continuity here, uh, I'll mention two or three real quick and then people should look these up and see for yourselves that these are things that really have, sh have been demonstrated to work. The Boston public schools have a full day pre-kindergarten program in just about every one of their elementary schools and the track record on this is evidence informed, researched, to the up and down the wazoo mm -hmm. and is demonstrating real progress in the improvement of literacy, numeracy, and other things that are valued in education. Mm -hmm. Second example, Mississippi's on our mind today. <laughs> I would recommend uh, just in general that you all read this book by Jim and Debbie Fallows called Our Towns. Actually, Jim Fallows was our guest the last time we were uh, doing this event. Um, they traveled across America and uh, descended on small towns that are usually just the flyover towns that most of us, at least I had never been to. One of their stops was in Mississippi where they had the occasion to visit a place called the Mississippi School for Mathematics and Science. Mm -hmm. Look this up. The kids arrive with a portfolio, without a portfolio of science genius, but they learn fast. In 2015, one of its alumni was chosen as the first African-American woman Rhodes Scholar from Mississippi. Evidence of the capacity mm -hmm. of an institution with the right resources and the right will to really make a difference. Third example is right here in DC. If you look at some place like the Langley Elementary School, now I mention this because the principal is one of our alumni from GW. <laughs> Her name is Vanessa Drum Kanepa, and she has an innovative program there in socio-emotional learning that has resulted in a dramatic reduction, among other things, in the suspension rate. Yeah, is yeah. that the whole answer to public education? Certainly not, but it's a, it makes a difference. It's moving in the right direction. Truesdale Education Campus, another school in the District of Columbia. Absolutely. Not exactly the easiest place to imagine yeah. uh, education reform. The principal, Marianne Stinson, the assistant principal, Michael Redmond, uh, both currently getting their doctoral degrees here. Coincidentally, <laughs> I thought I'd mention that. Oh. Are closing the opportunity gap in that community. Yeah. Uh, read up on Michael's book club, where he has young black boys reading African-American authors and other literature that is giving them a new sense of identity, belonging, hope, opportunity, and progress. And sure enough, their reading level at that school has gone up from 20% on grade level to almost 90% on grade mm -hmm. level. Progress is possible with the right kind of Preparation, support, and and uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Tenacity. Yeah. You can't give up on this stuff. Interesting, interesting examples, and and plenty to look up on. Uh, we've got um, we have a couple of people here for for question and answer. So please go ahead. Uh, I'm Gregory Prince, formerly a high school teacher, college professor, college president, now working with a not for profit. Uh, one question I have for all of you is I haven't heard much talk about the students in terms of their agency in this process. Ms. Steele, was, I was quite excited about 
the story she told about students being involved. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Henderson, one that I spend uh, almost every week in Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, the magnets are working. Mm -hmm. The charters are working. 70% of the students are going to the comprehensives, perceive themselves as going to the leftover bins because they're not in the magnets. Mm -hmm. They didn't get in the lotteries. It's not a choice system. It's a lottery system. Mm -hmm. We work with those students in the comprehensives, and they perform just as well as the magnets in the mm -hmm. conference if they're given the kind of socio-emotional mm -hmm. support. It's not they don't have to have a lot of, of cl classes. It isn't a question of the curriculum. It's a question of having people tell them yes. that they can do it, yes. believe in them, and support them. So, so I would like to hear more about what you would do. No, I, I think your, your question, your point is really well taken. I went to law school in Newark, and I'm very active in a couple of Newark institutions, one of which is Rutgers uh, Newark campus. Yeah. Nancy Cantor is the chancellor there, and she's doing an outstanding oh job. Yeah. And the engagement of the uh, college with the community uh, really helps lay the foundation for the kind of change that you've talked about. Uh, and I also have found that, you know, you get engagement from unlikely uh, players. Uh, Paul Fishman, who was the U.S. attorney up in Newark, was very active when he was the U.S. attorney. He's now on the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice Board, and that NGO is part of the litigation team bringing a lawsuit against the state of New Jersey along with Rutgers faculty and others. So uh, I'm very optimistic about Newark and the kinds of programs that Michael mentioned, and they can be accomplished at the local level. But your uh, initial point about the agency of students is really so well taken. What I have found is that when you really deal openly with students, and you know, I've, I, I speak at a summer program for student leaders around the country that Bank of America operates, which I think is terrific. And, and I see this incredibly diverse group of students. And when they talk about their concerns, they do so in a way which blows my mind. They are so focused and functioning at a high level. And what I find is that students have many of the answers that we seek and how to improve the quality of education that they have available to them. But often we don't listen or we don't take their advice and counsel as seriously as it deserves to be taken. So I think that has to be a very important part of any discussion about the future of public education. I'm glad you raised it. I'd like to yeah. squeeze in a couple more, sure. couple more questions Thank really you. quickly. Um, my name is Morgan Brill. I'm currently, sorry, I'm currently a student at GSHED, um, and I also work at Widmeyer Communications. Um, and this is a question that I'm pulling from Professor Glazer's class, so my cohort who are here will know what I'm talking about. But um, and kind of know that I'm cheating a little bit. Um, but I'd love to speak a little bit about the roles that charter schools play in this climate. Um, do they increase equity or exacerbate inequality? Um, we know that in certain environments they raise yeah. test scores, but they also might make it harder for traditional schools to pay fixed, to pay fixed costs. Um, they exacerbate, to some extent, the segregation that Wade mentioned. Um, and just by and large, not every student can mm -hmm. go to a charter school. Um, so I guess, to me, at least, it seems like we're at a crossroads. Um, and I guess my question is, where do we go from here? Mm. Well, this is, again, just, you know, since I'm an evidence guy, this is evidence of the great capacity of the George Washington University School of Education. We have <laughs> students who are asking these really tough questions. Yes, they are. OK, but I'm going to try to answer this just real quickly. On the business of charters, um, this is a, a terrific example of the attempt to find some balance between the potential for innovation and progress that can happen when institutional rules are somehow changed, relaxed, or modified versus, again, the downside risk that by allowing that kind of a system to uh, proliferate, we may actually end up uh, perpetuating and making even worse the kind of inequities that essentially we were starting out to mm -hmm. try to solve. And as you know, because you're studying this stuff, uh, the evidence is mixed. But let's not ever forget that the people who advocate for the wholesale market, marketization and privatization of American education are not putting the possibility of increased segregation and inequity 
at a level that it, it warrants in terms of figuring out whether all of that is really what we, we want to do. We get up. Does anyone have a, No, I, it oh. does. Can I just add one thing? I'm Thank so you. sorry. Everybody one here thing. is I'm voting. We're going to stay here for the rest of the yeah, afternoon and figuring all very, this very stuff quickly. out. Look, you know, it's, it's great. I'm, I don't disagree at all with Michael's observation, uh, but I would say this. There are problems that are below the surface that need to be examined. You know, when you cream students from public education and you take them into charter schools, mm -hmm. you doom the public education to deal with some of the most hardcore, uh, you know, circumstances of poverty that exist. Is that really what we want to do? Let's lift up, by the way, the teachers in West Virginia and Kentucky and Arizona and others who raised hell about the lack of funding for, stu for students at public schools. Were it not for those teachers, it would have been almost impossible to get aid uh, in those schools but for their strikes. So I'm just saying, guys, <laughs> don't look. Uh, generalizations are important. In general. In general, right? <laughs> but look <laughs> beneath the surface and see if we can do that. Sir. 30 um, seconds for our question, and then... Uh, and then five start. minutes for each answer. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Given that I have so much time, I'll start with the lighthearted topic of structural inequality. Uh, <laughs> but, no, so to, to your point, uh, with reg I was really inspired by a lot of what you both said, but, Mr. Henderson, with the um, lifting up the litigators in um, really using the legal system to be able to tackle school funding inequities, what do you see as the strategy or some of the strategy yeah. to be able to force the hand of legislators that are refusing to act um, in making sure that the systems are more equitable. That's a great funded. question. First of all, I think most of the, great question, most of the litigation that is likely to succeed will be done at the state level, not at the federal level. Obviously, the courts are changing. It's unlikely that we're going to see you know, a positive outcome at the federal level. I don't want to overgeneralize, but it's going to be a problem. So state litigation is going to be key. And using the contradictions inherent in state constitutions that promise a quality public education to every student on the one hand, but fail to deliver that, as my friend Michael says, there's evidence to support that. And using those contradictions to force the court to grapple mm -hmm. with the inequity that exists. That was the strategy that was used by Charles Hamilton Houston at Howard Law School with Thurgood Marshall and others to use the contradictions of the existing system, the difference between what you say and what you do under the Constitution as a way of helping to advance that and being persistent. When victory after victory was established in the courts in Kansas, the state legislature resisted implementing solutions. And these litigators would not take no for an answer. They went back and they fought. So I have a lot of respect for those who are litigating the issues, and as someone who has been an advocate and lobbyist at the federal level, that litigation opens up opportunities to negotiate meaningful solutions to some of the problems that exist around equity. And until you know, the need for improvements because of the changing demographics and the changing needs of the workforce catch up with the diversity that exists now, you're going to have short-term solutions based on litigation and advocacy, and it's got to be coordinated, and it's got to be targeted, and it's got to be strategic. And what I'm finding is that these activists who are out here now are very strategic, very thoughtful. I give them a lot of credit. They're pulling on the past, but they're also looking to the future. They're charting their own course for how to bring about change, and they're doing so in conjunction with other groups that have other responsibilities. Voting expansion is a big part of that. So I look at Florida that just had a referendum that now has empowered a million and a half individuals who were excluded from voting because of criminal convictions in Florida, who will now be voting from 2020 onward. Now, is it going to make a difference at the outset? I hope so. But they're going to have to be organized and educated and brought into the system. That's a longer term effort. So it's those kinds of grassroots engagements that I'm thinking of that will help in moving it forward. Thank you very much. And I just want to leave you with one, one final observation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, no, hold on. Well, I know, I see the zeros the flashing. We're going to take it out in the hallway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just one point about the role of states in all of this mm. that I would love to, I'd love to leave you with this uh, observation. It turns out that the National Governors Association, and you mm -hmm. heard from Stephen Parker earlier, National Governors Association today, the chair 
is a Democrat in, from a red state, that's Governor Bullock of Montana, and the co-chair <laughs> is a uh, Republican from a blue state, that's Larry Hogan from Maryland. And if you think about the combined power of an organization such as the National Governors Association, and the idea that these guys are finding ways to solve real problems and tackle these big issues, I add that to my new and improved recipe <laughs> for optimism about the future of the American mm. system. Thank you very much, Wayne. Thank you, guys. Michael. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all.